And so I want us to look at five facets of friendship here that Jesus teaches us about as to what we can have with Him and what we can have with one another in a real church. And first, I hear in these words of Jesus, friends, haven't you any fish? The idea that friends take a genuine interest in, their, in, in other people who are their friends. I believe that's what Jesus was doing here. He wasn't being sly. I think when he said, haven't you any fish, he was showing an interest in them. And that's part of what begins a friendship and keeps it going, a genuine interest in one another. When I think about this, I think of our son David. David's with Samaritan's Purse. He told me the story of going down to Tajikistan, the ninth poorest nation in the world, just behind Afghanistan that borders them on the south. And he shared with me this story that when he had gone to Tajikistan to help with the distribution of some Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes, he met a guy named Alexander. And Alexander works with a prison ministry. And the reason is, is because he had spent 10 years in a prison and that's where he became a Christian. And his story was is that he was a drug dealer. His dad was a political figure in the country. His dad kept bailing him out and bailing him out of jail, but finally his dad said enough, and Alexander was in prison for 10 years. And during that time, he became more and more hard. But there were some Christians from a church in town that used to come in toward the middle of his time there, and they were just normal people coming in. And one day, one of the men, as they left, went over and put his hand on Alexander's shoulder and said, friend. And then left, but came back, and they began to have a friendship. And Alexander came to know Christ, and now he's working in prisons, just like the one he suffered in. Because one Christian showed friendship to another person who didn't even know Christ. So that's the first facet of friendship, taking interest in the other person. The second is that what Jesus does here when he says, throw your net on the right side of the boat. Secondly, I believe that friends do what they can to help other friends. Now, Jesus could have created a school of fish or he could have guided them to where all the fish were. But the point is, is that Jesus was able to, as the Son of God, help them in their catch. And that's exactly what he did, because that's what friends do. They help where they can. And Peter had seen this before. Back in Luke chapter 5, there's a description of how one day G, uh, Peter was fishing and they weren't catching anything. And Jesus called to put their nets down on the other side and of the boat and they just brought in this huge catch of fish and you remember what Peter said depart from me Lord I'm a sinful man and that's about the time that he came to give his life to Christ and trust in Christ but now this next scene happens and when they see this net full of fish John is the one who says it's the Lord they jumped in the water and they went onto the shore because they realized that Jesus was in their midst. Well, I want to ask you if uh, maybe you're kind of like the apostles were here. Have you been out fishing and catching nothing all night long? Have you been doing the same thing again and again and just no results? Kind of like these fishermen 
all that energy you've been expending, but nothing's coming from it? Well, I believe the picture here is, is that sometimes a mysterious man on the beach will come to us with a new direction. And we have to discern, is this the Lord speaking through this person? Is God giving us some direction that we need that we just can't quite see ourselves? And this has happened to me again and again in my life where someone comes to me and suggests, have you tried this? And as I pray about it, I sense it's the Lord that had sent them. And when I pivot and go that new direction, it's amazing what happens. And I believe that's what's happening here, and I believe that's what God wants to encourage us, that He's our friend, and He's willing to come to us, sometimes in a mysterious way, like a man on a beach that they didn't recognize, because God wants to give us a new direction. And so the apostles listened, and they brought in 153 fish. Now, it's interesting to read different people's accounts of this and what they say the 153 fish represent. I've read people who said that this represents the fact that at the end of the world there'll be 153 countries. Well, we're way past that. And there's all kinds of other like mystical interpretations of what 153 means. You know what I think it means? I think it means that these guys really were fishermen, and fishermen really do count fish. And it stuck in their minds. They were amazed that there were 153 fish. And this points us to not some kind of fable or fiction, but it points to the fact that this really happened. Jesus kept showing them that though he was out of their sight, he was still in their midst and that he cared about them as friends. And then Jesus says to them, hey, bring the fish you've caught and come, let's have breakfast. And this is the one that, this is a third thing, a third facet of friendship, and that is that friends share table fellowship. We don't get to know people more deeply unless we spend time with them, often around a meal, around coffee, or something that we're sharing together like that. And here's the Lamb of God with nail-pierced hands coming to the beach, making fish fillets for his friends. And isn't it interesting, he comes not and says, okay, I want everybody in a classroom, I'm gonna teach you for the next four hours. He doesn't come and say, okay, we're gonna do strategic planning as to how we're gonna conquer the world. He doesn't give them some kind of ecstatic uh, experience that's out of the body. Now what does he do? He kicks back on the beach with his friends. And they laugh, and they listen to each other, and they tell stories, and they enjoy the food, because that's what friends do. Isn't it amazing that that's what the Son of God wants with us? And that's what He wants us to have with each other? That it's great just to be friends? And that real churches have this dimension? They don't just come once a week for an hour? But there's genuine friendship there. In fact, in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, we read that the church of Jerusalem, when it was born, and it was new, and it was growing, every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There was a period of time when our second son, Derek, had just gotten married to Michelle, who's from Brazil, and they were living in Chicago near where we were. And after they'd been married a couple of years, my son said to me, hey, you know, Dad, I really respect your marriage with Mom. Not that there aren't problems, but I really respect your marriage. And I got three or four other guys, and we'd like to meet with you every other week and talk about marriage. And so we'd go out for breakfast early in the morning and we'd share table fellowship and we'd talk about what's happening in our lives and in our marriages and we were honest with each other. And that was the one thing Derek said was, we're going to be honest 
We're going to set some goals and we're going to hold each other accountable. We're not going to just kick back and have breakfast. And isn't it interesting that that's where this story moves? Because it starts with just table fellowship, kicking back, enjoying food on the beach. But then, in verse 15, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And this is a fourth facet of friendship, and that is that if we are really friends, we'll ask each other tough questions. And we'll hold each other accountable. And we'll even give some wisdom to one another and listen to one another. You know, Jesus asked a tough question here. Peter, do you love me more than these? It's interesting to think about what are the more than these. Some suggest he was saying and pointing over to the boats. Peter, do you love me more than your job? Do you love me more than going fishing, which you love? Do you love me more than this? Others suggested that maybe he was pointing to his friends and saying, the other apostles and saying, Peter, do you love me more than these, these other men? I tend to think that what Jesus was doing is he was pointing all over and saying to Peter, he was saying, in essence, Peter, do you love me more than your life, your friends, your family, your fishing. Do you love me more than all of this? Tough question. But that's the way real friendships form. They ask, we ask each other the tough questions. And we give tough answers. Isn't it interesting that Jesus says, in light of this, when he, Peter says three times, Yes, I do, Lord. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Jesus gives them direction. That's part of what friendships mean as well. We really need this kind of relationship with one another, and that's really what a real church is intended to be. One person, Scott Peck, in his book, The Different Drummer, warns about fake fellowship. He says that the first response of a group is sometimes to try to fake it. The members try to be pleasant with one another. They try to avoid all disagreement. But this is pseudo-community. It's fake. It never works. It's cheap pretense. We have to get beyond this, the telling of little white lies, of withholding the truth, because this is a shortcut to nowhere. And so, if we really want to go deeper with a friend, we've got to ask those tough questions, and we've got to share our hearts, and we've got to be able to listen to one another's counsel. And that's what we see happening with Jesus here on the beach. And he's showing us what real friendship is all about. And it's interesting the time and place that Jesus chooses to ask Peter these three tough questions. The Scripture says here that you'll notice... It was by a charcoal fire that he had built. Well, this same Greek word, charcoal fire, is used back in John chapter 18, verse 18. And it's the same word that describes the place in the, temp- in the courtyard of the high priest where J- Peter went by a charcoal fire in the courtyard. And that's where three times he denied that he even knew the Lord. And now Jesus builds a charcoal fire. And three times will ask Peter, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? Because Jesus wants to restore him to service and move him away from self-protection and recommission him to be the leader that God wanted him to be. And then he tells him the kind of another hard thing about what he'll face in the future. And he says, I tell you the truth, 
When you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went out where you wanted, but when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Verse 18, and Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Peter will live many, many more years, but he knows from this prophecy from the Lord that one day he will be let out with his hands where he does not want them and led to a place he does not want to go. And the tradition is, is that Jesus and uh, that Peter indeed did follow his Lord and that he was hung on a cross with a crossbar upside down. Is following Christ sometimes will involve that. And that leads us to the final facet of, of friendship with Jesus in particular. And that is when um, Peter begins to ask about John and what's going to happen in his future. And Jesus said, if I want him to stay until I return, what's that to you? He then says to him, this is the facet of friendship that's really different when it comes to Jesus, and that is, you follow me. You see, Jesus wants to be our friend, and indeed, you know, he really does care about what's happening in our lives, and he's there to help when we really need it. And he shares fellowship with us and with others that are his followers. And he'll ask us tough questions, and he'll give us hard guidance. But in the end, there's something different in our relationship with Jesus that's different from any other friend, and that is, we're to follow him. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. And in verses 20 and 23, isn't it interesting that, again, Peter saw and heard this, follow me, and what's he do? He looks over his shoulder and says, well, what about John? What's going to happen to him? What's ahead for him? Jesus again tells him, you follow me. If I want him to remain until I return, what is that to you? And one of the temptations with our friends as we follow Christ is we can kind of turn over our shoulder and say, man, that guy He really has a lot better job than I do. Lord, why is that? Why can't I have that? Or we can turn over our shoulder and say, Lord, why is it that I've got this really tough relationship? Or we've been given this terrible trial in our family. Lord, what about him? What about those people over there that aren't having to go through that? And Jesus brings us back and says, you follow me. which is sometimes the hardest part of the friendship, but in the end, it's the most rewarding. J. Oswald Chambers put it this way, that when we're trying to point to the other person, we have to learn that there's dangers in amateur providence where we're trying to give somebody else God's plan. We must follow him. And isn't it great to know that as we follow him, he really does care about us. He will help. He will give us this sense of his presence and with his people. He'll ask us tough questions and he'll give us hard direction. But as we follow him, we will have a friendship with the one true God through his son, Jesus Christ. 